Welcome to Charity Therapy, a podcast from Birkin Law about building better nonprofits. I'm your host, Jess Birkin. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Charity Therapy. This time we're flying solo. Well, not really solo. I've got my wing woman and co host, Megan. Megan, how's it going? Not too bad. It is thunderstorming here, though, so you may hear a rumble in the background. What about you? I mean, same, right? We're both sitting in the Twin Cities. It is dark. It looks like nighttime. It's very bizarre. I kind of love it, not going to lie. I love a good thunderstorm. Exactly. It's, It's like sweaters and tea and cozy light bulbs in the window. Exactly. So today I've got three questions from folks who are all dealing with like some different shady behavior (laughs) from folks within their organization. And we're not just talking like generally unethical. We're talking straight up like breaking the law, illegal, this is terrible. How do we deal with this kind of stuff? Are you ready? Sounds like it's going to be stormy for those nonprofits, Megan. (laughs) Let's get started. Okay. I sit on the board of a nonprofit that was founded by one prominent guy who is an advocate for various disenfranchised groups. The founder is still on the board as the president. I was recently given a copy of court records that show that the founder sexually assaulted an employee several years ago. The founder paid the employee $10,000, got her to sign a confidentiality agreement, and nothing else happened. I plan to resign immediately and let the founder know that I am doing so because of the content of those court records. Anything else I should do? This is a weird one because just like as a lawyer, I'm like, if there was a sexual assault and it was settled with a confidentiality agreement, how do you have records? Like, Right. Something about this is weird. You know, there's nothing in here other than that that gives me the little vibes of, like, this feels like a smear campaign because nobody should have those records. So if they've got them, it's like this founder clearly has some enemies. However, that said, gross. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. I get the instinct to sort of be revolted by finding out this prominent member of your community who claims to be a good guy is part of the whole me too thing. Um, So, you know, this could go either way, but it's, it's not really like, this is something that's over and done with. It's old news. It's been settled between the people. Not sure why you have the information, but you're probably not supposed to have the information. So I guess whether you want to tell them that you have the information, I would just probably encourage you to take a pause to think about the context of why you got this, that there's a possibility that the person who was assaulted may be accused of violating their confidentiality agreement because how did this get out and you may be causing more harm to the person who was sexually assaulted by just creating a bunch of drama around this. And I would just encourage you to sort of like, you don't need to make this about you necessarily. If you don't want to work with this person anymore, you can definitely resign. In the end, it's your moral compass. I mean, you can always resign. And I feel like sometimes people forget that they can quit. Like they think they're tied to the mast of the nonprofit. And it's like, bro, remember, it's a volunteer job. You can walk away. And sometimes people don't want to walk away because they feel like they have a duty to protect and they do. But also if you just fundamentally are disgusted by this founder and you don't want to work with them anymore, you can walk away. And I'm not, I don't have enough facts here to like definitively say you should tell them, you shouldn't tell them, but I would just take a minute to consider why you want to tell them and whether it's really about you and your feelings and you wanting to to have the good feeling of telling them off versus is there any benefit or any harm that could come 
from you sort of announcing your reasons for leaving? I don't know. That's a tough one. It is a tough one. Like you said, there's just like not enough detail to really know what's going on. Cause like the first thing that popped in my head is like, you know, has this caused you to reflect on any of this president and founders behavior today? And is there anything in their behavior that you need to be concerned about today, knowing history and things like that? You know, it's like if you have staff or you have other things you need to know about, you know, as I think they said they were the executive director um, no, on the board, but it's just like, you do need to consider the whole picture and whether that means leaving quietly or whatever, like there are just a lot of details and it's not a cut and dried situation. No, it's not. And there, you know, there's, it's not your job as a board member to find out somebody's criminal history no. and then go make a campaign to every person in the organization, let them know what you learned. And yeah, I mean, that's, in the end, the question is, is there anything else I should do? No, not necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. This is just, it's tough because maybe there are other people who have had a problem or been assaulted, but like, maybe not. Right. <laughs> and you don't know what harm you're going to cause to the person who was involved in this. So it's just, it's just a really hard question. It's not, you don't get to stand up on your, your uh, pillar of justice and pretend that you know exactly what to do here. Absolutely. All right. I have another one for you. I am on the board of a small nonprofit and we have significant evidence that the president and the treasurer, who are sisters, have taken a little over $1,000 out of club funds. Not a lot, but this is a small club, and that's a big chunk of our budget. They have, of course, denied it, but evidence. We are not entirely sure how to proceed from here. Police, lawyers, IRS, we've never had something like this happen before in the club's 50-plus years of existence. Um, okay, so first of all, significant evidence. But they don't say what that is. What is it? Right. You know, uh, are you are you totally sure that it's fraud? Have you had an accountant look into it? Did they admit to it? Like, obviously not. They're denying it. I would just be careful. Make sure that your evidence is super airtight. And, you know, what do you do? Police, lawyers, IRS? Well, D, all of the above, right? You can do all mm -hmm. of those things. You can file a police report. They've stolen money. That's a crime. Now, the police might tell you that's a civil problem and not a criminal problem, and they don't want to deal with it. You absolutely could hire a lawyer. I work with clients who come in where something like this has happened, and most of the time, I'm not helping them necessarily go after the person. I'm helping them shore up the organization and saying, how did this happen? Let's work on that. You know, let's figure out where are the problems in your organization. Let's make sure we have compliant policies and procedures. Let's sh make sure we're following nonprofit sector best practices for financial controls. Sounds like a small group. Sounds like they don't have good segregation of duties. And sounds like they need a policy that says you can't have two family members on the board at the same time. And, you know, if it gets hairy, you can report this to the attorney general. I wouldn't say the IRS. Or, I mean, you could, but I think that's just like throwing a bottle with a message into a black hole. Whereas your state's attorney general's office may be more equipped to take an enforcement action in the state, at the state level. But first, you know, I would probably, if this were a client at, at the firm, I would probably be saying, we need to seek restitution from these folks and say, listen, you can deny it all day long, but here's the hard evidence that shows this money went into your personal bank account. You need to return this money immediately. And, you know, here is a place you can go online and use a credit card to pay it back. And we should be removing them from the board. Absolutely. People who have stolen have violated their fiduciary duties they should not be on the board. They should definitely not be the president and the treasurer. And that in a small group, and it says club, so I'm assuming it's some sort of member-based organization, that can get really ugly really fast. So that's where I would say 
contact an attorney, make sure you're doing everything right, and make sure you have a plan for how you're going to shore things up going forward, for sure. Right. It's the long-term plan and the short-term plan of like, clean up what has happened, make sure it's never going to happen again. Yeah. And just remember that like, if your bylaws don't tell you how to remove a board member, you need to look at the state statute because there is probably a state nonprofit law that tells you how to remove a board member. And sometimes that law is different based on if you have voting members or non-voting members. So there are legal requirements and you need to look at your bylaws, but also probably look at the state statute. Right. Lord knows enough people have come in through our doors and been like, we removed these people and now we're being told that was void because we didn't, didn't do it right. And it's just, it just adds to the people problem. Yeah, drawing out the agony of trying to do the crisis triaging at the beginning there. Okay, I have one last question for you, and this one is kind of thorny. It has come to our attention that a member has a previous conviction for stalking a minor and was recently arrested for solicitation of a minor. The board and the members who are aware want to remove him from our community, which can include folks under 18. We are a 501c3 with no formal membership, just an online community and regular in-person meetings. Our bylaws and code of conduct don't explicitly detail what to do in this situation. Our code of conduct references stalking, but it's implied that it's against participants, not participants stalking non-participants. What can we do? Wow, this is really a mess because, you know, what... (sighs) If the, this is unrelated to their participation in the nonprofit, right? That's my re, my understanding of this. But it's also repugnant, right? Solicitation of a minor, that's um, asking a child for sex. So that's like your classic uh, sting operation where the adult is web chatting with someone who says they're 14 and it's actually a cop. So this is gross. You have kids under 18 in your community, but they don't have formal membership. So they must have just like a message board and just a tight-knit community. This is probably a good opportunity to revamp those policies and procedures. Code of conduct needs to really apply to everybody not just program participants, but like how you conduct yourself. And this can just be tough tough because like this person was arrested, but not convicted. So people are going to be like, this is discriminatory. What if they're innocent, you know, innocent until proven guilty. Also, this wasn't related to their actions at the nonprofit. But here's the thing. Participation in your community is voluntary and you do define the terms for your code of conduct. So this is just really messy. And without talking to these people and really understanding all of the facts, it's really hard to give a straight answer on this. But this is a, I mean, I've definitely had clients with situations like this and it is never easy because you're considering your own morals. I mean, especially if it's like a faith-based community and you have like a lot of value placed on forgiveness and maybe Christian principles or other theological principles. It's just really tough. Like, what do you do? Because you you also have an obligation to protect the other people in your community. And an arrest is not a conviction. And it's not related to their conduct necessarily inside the community. And some people aren't going to like it. And this is going to be a divisive issue. And how do you handle it without you know, sort of hanging this person out to dry because you don't need to get up on a podium and and publicly stone this guy. You just want to make sure that you're protecting your community. It's just really tough. I don't have a clear answer on this one. Right. It's sort of like that first question where there's just like a lot of details that could affect how this goes. Um, And when you're talking about crimes like these, everyone's emotions are already heightened Everyone is ready to bring the torches and the pitchforks right off the bat. So it's like a hard one to read into just based on a short description of what's been going on. And it really depends on like, what is this person's role at the organization? Are they just like a random 
pleb who chimes in on the message boards and shows up? Are they in a leadership role? Do they have direct contact with minors? You know, what are your policies around that? I don't have any clue what their programming is. The board is going to feel pressured to do something because they don't want to look like they don't care. It's really hard to decide how to handle these without a real long conversation. (laughs) They should reach out and talk to a professional. And, you know, you really have to figure out your communications about this as well, because the people who do know are really upset. And there are people who don't know that don't need to know. We don't need to take it upon ourselves to like give this person a bad name when they haven't even been convicted yet. So it's really, really, really tough. So this brings up a broader question that I have, Jess, actually. This isn't about this situation, but just generally. Private nonprofits who have participants in their programs, can they not kick people out just because? Like, does there have to be a specific reason to kick people out? I mean, like codes of conduct and policies and all that aside, like how does this go for nonprofits? Well, it depends, right? So it it depends. Classic lawyer answer. I I know. Sorry. You know, if you have voting members, your voting members have rights by statute. So you can kick those people out, but you have to follow a process. If you're just like, hey, we're such and such pet rescue and we're just a garden variety 501c3 with a board and a bunch of like very passionate volunteers. And we all, (laughs) you and I both know that animal organizations have the most drama. (laughs) The most passion, (laughs) the most drama. (laughs) The most passion and the most drama. You know, they can decide to oust each other all day long without any like process. Um, But it's nice to have a process. Otherwise, it looks like you're playing favorites. There's just a lot of opportunity for discrimination or accusations of discrimination or unfair treatment. And that's not necessarily like a legal issue, but it is going to affect your organization's credibility and reputation. And trust me when I say these things go on Facebook and then people are talking about you and blah, blah, blah. And that's more of the time when I am dealing with a client in that situation, it's about what people are saying on Facebook and it has nothing to do with legal, like a complaint was filed in a court of law, right? It's the people aspects. So yes, they can do whatever they want. They are private corporations to the extent that they don't have any rules that apply they can make them up as they go but it's just much better to try and have some sort of guardrails set up so that you can at least say you are following and being consistent with your policies and even when you have all of those things something like this is just going to be incredibly difficult no matter what so at least have the structure Like, legally, a lot of times, you can do what you want. Yeah. (laughs) It's just more than just legal stuff. I mean, we see this all the time with, you know, crisis clients that come in that it's like, you know, when the drama storm kicks up and everyone's chattering on Facebook, like, that's where anything that is not being done properly within the nonprofit might be exposed. You know, like, you don't want there to be seedy underbelly things that people are now looking really closely at you because of whatever unrelated people drama there is. Um, Jess, I remember you wrote an article a couple of years ago about the NRA with the same thing where there were people drama and then it's like, oh wait, there's fraud. <laughs> yeah, and even when there's not outright nefarious stuff happening at the nonprofit, people get mad and they don't like you and so they start making allegations online in the YouTube comments or on the TikTok or whatever and it doesn't have to be true. Right. You know, so the more that you can act like professionals that are following, you know, your upstanding professionals that have policies that are managing the situation and make those people look like, you know, crazy nut jobs who are making false accusations, so much the better. Because a lot of times there is nothing bad going on. They're just angry people. Totally. All right, Jess. So based on this conversation, I have a couple takeaways for us. First, I think a big one is that as a nonprofit professional or a board member, it's not your job to uncover 
criminal history or whatever that has happened in the past with everybody involved and make a whole moral panic campaign about it. You're dealing with the here and now, and it's not your job to to police other people necessarily. And I think that goes hand in hand with my second point, which is that your actual duty is to protect the organization and to do what's best for the nonprofit first and foremost. So whether that means removing someone, whether that means whatever other actions you might want to take, your duty is to do what's best for the nonprofit as a board member with your fiduciary duties. And the last piece I think is really the most important is that your communications matter. (laughs) How you handle the situation is not just about following the letter of the law. Public opinion matters and how you are going to, you know, communicate to your constituents matters a lot in how the organization is going to weather through the storm. Absolutely. And, you know, don't forget if you're a volunteer, sometimes it's okay to just walk away. Yeah. If it's a mess, sometimes it's not your mess to clean up. Yeah. Sometimes it is. (laughs) (laughs) But sometimes my advice is still going to be, don't forget you're a volunteer. Just walk away. Oh, Megan, as always, thank you for being my co-pilot. If you, uh, enjoyed this episode, do me a huge favor and share it with a friend. You know Megan's going to be sharing it. Always. Great review. Subscribe. You know Megan is subscribed. Don't you want to be like Megan? (laughs) Get it on your podcast app. It really helps us out. If you have a question or a story to share, I want to hear from you. Send me a note online or leave a voice memo by calling 612-208-9120. See you next time. All right, folks, that's our show. Be sure to follow me on Instagram or Twitter at Jess Birkin. We want to hear from you. Send us a message at our website, charitytherapy.show. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at birkinlaw.com slash sign up. Charity Therapy is a production of Birkin Law Office, PLLC. Our theme song is by Whalehawk. And remember, folks... This podcast is produced for your entertainment and is not a substitute for actual legal advice.